see her. All right. Fabulous. Welcome, everybody, to Making Smartphones Fairer. I'm Sue Newhook, and I'm the one doing the setup. Hi. Okay, we're good? I'm the one doing the setup and a little bit of context and maybe give you a couple of ways to think about what seems like something extremely new um, and it's still in its growing stages but uh, we also have some historical precedents that we can talk about. Um, my name is Sue Newhook and I teach journalism at the University of King's College in Halifax, Canada, not the one in London. Um, the teaching part of my job involves, uh, includes shooting uh, mobile video reporting courses. And my research interests include a collection of community development films from the 1960s. Now you might not think that those two things have much to do with each other, but it turns out it's uh, quite a lot. Um, I'll start with the teaching though. I teach most of my undergrad and graduate courses on video, partly or entirely with smartphones. We've been doing it for several years now. And we're all learning a lot in the process. We've got two anecdotal but useful and fairly consistent takeaways so far. First, we find that most students are learning visual storytelling skills and disciplines faster on smartphones. They become more fluent more quickly in visual language and grammar, things like framing sequences and the importance of getting good sound and they can concentrate more than on editorial and creative thinking, like high shots, drone shots with a selfie stick, and less on the technology <coughs> details. Second, we practice what we preach. And I just went to black. Oh, there we go. Uh, we practice what we preach. We've got our senior undergraduates produce a weekly news magazine as a two-camera live stream using mobile entirely, and we come from different locations around our city. This reinforces the idea that there are simple and inexpensive ways to, as we say, commit acts of journalism with a phone and make it look good. Now, I want to make a point here that most people don't come to this automatically. Um, people say digital natives are completely used to video, but they're really not. Um, it's kind of like food, you know? We all eat, but we aren't all good cooks. And some of us starting out don't know how to turn the stove on, right? So starting out with a smartphone will get you, get you off to a great start, even though a lot of people say, we want real cameras. They do see quickly, though, that smartphones can uh, open up storytelling in a whole bunch of ways, just the way, the way the web and even the printing press democratize text. And when you use your smartphone um, smartly, the results are actually pretty good. So after graduation, our students find that Mojo is a useful skill for covering some of Canada's really far-flung communities. And Corin's going to talk about this guy, uh, Dan, uh, Dan McGarvey, in a few minutes. But I'll, tell, I'll show you a couple of our grads. Uh, this one, Hayden Waters, is uh, using social media to prop, promote the pop-up mobile bureaus he does with, for both radio and uh, online in small towns around his home base. Another grad uh, recently drew on her mojo practice in small town Canada to pitch an affordable freelance trip to Iraq. And, and she's taken that freelance practice, uh, partly mobile, partly DSLR, and, and for radio to a whole bunch of different places. So they find the smartphones work as icebreakers. They, give a, they create a common connection. And, and this is, as I say, it's anecdotal, but it's pretty consistent. Now, as far as, far as scholarly research goes, uh, there still isn't a huge amount out there, and it can get dated pretty quickly. But one useful and practical study is from just last year, Here's your cameo, Panu. Uh, Panu Karhunen's uh, report for the Reuters Institute at Oxford includes some history and an overview of current mobile practice in Europe. And he also did a field project. Um, he went into the field because he wanted to test the idea among mojos that people prefer to talk to a, mojo, a smartphone reporter. So he spent two days in a shopping mall, the sacrifice for his work. Um, he approached 400 people, half on his own with this mojo kit, 
and half as part of a traditional two-person video crew. He found that people were almost 60% more likely to give an interview to the guy with the smartphone. The report contains much more detail. It's well worth a look, and Panu is here today as well. It's another great thing about the Journalism Festival. Wave, Panu. <laughs> So I'd encourage you to talk to him about his research. Um, but what does all this have to do with what I started out mentioning, old community development films? Um, 1967, 51 years ago, so in internet years, that is literally prehistoric. But uh, this film and others like it helped me to see the potential of mobile journalism in the first place. You know, we start talk about traveling light, keeping things simple, and being interactive as, as if these are ideas of the last 10 years. But there are all kinds of precedents that we can draw lessons from. Um, and this is one of them, I think. The Fogo Island Film Project happened on that little red dot up there. Um, it's an island off the island of Newfoundland on Canada's east coast. And in 1967, changing times meant that Fogo Island was facing the possible collapse and even resettlement of some centuries-old fishing communities on the island. And the islanders felt helpless and powerless to stop it. So enter an unlikely team. Uh, Fred Earl was among the community workers from Memorial University of Newfoundland and top documentary filmmakers, this is important, from the National Film Board of Canada. This group set out to help the islanders find ways to survive. So for a very short version of what they did, because it took them months, um, Fred was the university's local outreach officer. So he was the entree. He, because people on the island knew and trusted him. And with his help, the NFB team used small film cameras to capture a series of interviews, meetings, and community events. And then they screened the films around the island and for the government and university people in the capital, which was a hard day's drive away. Um, everybody talked about the issues in the films, trying to break down years, generations even, of, of class, religion, and isolation, walls around all those things. So just to show you a bit of one example, um, Billy Crane, the guy on the right, um, had been fishing from a small boat on an open ocean since he was nine years old not someone you'd generally see in a film in 1967. But we see him packing up his gear for the last time. And some people may find the uh, accents a little hard here. So just to set it up, Mr. Fra Mr. Crane tells Fred uh, Earl, who is the community officer on the, on the left, um, that the fishery's been failing for years and he's packing it in. He's moving to the big city to, um, hello mouse, to, um, work as a laborer, and he's taking some pretty serious anger with him. I hope you can hear this all right. It runs about a minute. As far as I'm concerned, the fishery is out anyway, or that's the inshore fishery. The failing overlay this last four years, and well, this year will be the worst. That's for me anyway, and I think for the most of the fishermen around there. Did you see it approaching? Yeah, well, you, I think we all saw it as now for the last three or four years anyway. And I've come well. It, we must get out. I got to get out anyway. Perhaps some, some of the crowd is going to hang on a while yet, but... Do you think the inshore fishermen got a square break? No, I don't, sir, think the inshore fishermen have got a square break. I don't think that there been anything done for the inshore fishery yet. He was a very unhappy man, and he foretold a whole series of problems that developed in the North Atlantic cod fishery years before scientists ever gave any thought to them at all. But the conversations and the arguments sparked by this film and two dozen others like it, enough to populate a YouTube channel, um, help to find solutions that have lasted to this day. But old films and smartphones seem like they're light years apart. But you can hack history. You can look at what people did before and think about how you can adapt it to your mobile practice, since so many of you are already mucking about with it. This whole process that I'm talking about here can be compared, if you think about it, to web conferences, 
interactive live streams and social media campaigns just in very slow motion. <laughs> so if you go back to the kitchen that I was talking about earlier, um, I'll wrap with a few ingredients that connect then and now and things that play to Mojo's strengths in reaching remote and diverse communities that my colleagues will talk about in more detail. Uh, first of all, there's obviously story and storyteller. Um, the best vehicles for these things aren't always journalists or secondhand experts. Uh, communities want to see and hear themselves on the screen, and especially when those, those captures are done well. So that leads to production and other professional skills. This is where training comes in, and, and I want to give a shout out to ethics and visual grammar because I think sometimes those are undervalued a bit in this kind of uh, exercise. Then of course you've got connection, making a connection, which of course nowadays we call interactivity and engagement, but it's all the same thing. And if you don't have that kind of connection with your subjects and your audience, obviously these things don't matter. Mobile simplifies collaboration and feedback. And as I mentioned, the smartphone is also an icebreaker. And finally, pulling all this stuff together is just creativity and imagination thinking to do innovative things with your smartphone, and then figuring out how to do it and using the tools you have at hand in a range of new ways. This is still a new field, and it's open to new workflows and new approaches. It can offer power and agency, as the sociologists like to talk about, to reporters and citizens. And uh, my fellow panelists will now give you some awesome examples of that. But I'm done. Thanks to these folks on the screen and to you all for coming, which I should have said at the beginning. Um, and now over to Corin. You're up. Yep. Great. Excellent. So if you go forward, I guess you'll be somewhere else. There you go. Keep going. Hit forward again. I am hitting forward. Pop? He's I think he's still here to do. Wait a second, and we will start it up. I think. Yes. Yep. Here you go. Great. Excellent. Terrific. <laughs> now go. There we go. Oh, no, back. There we go. Fantastic. Hi, Hi everybody. Um, I'll bring this around. Excellent. So, um, I've been teaching digital storytelling for the last five years. Um, and mostly in developing countries uh, and also to students. And what I'm consistently asked for is how do I use my smartphone particularly for video? So it's this, this huge interest in learning these skill sets. Um, this presentation is based on consultations with people who are doing innovative work in this space. Um, one thing I would say is that studying mobile journalism is not easy. Panu's paper is, as, as Sue said, very rare. Um, one of the reasons is that Mojo right at the moment is a moving target. So it's pretty well established in radio journalism, but it's still really quite new in video journalism and the take up is far from universal. Um, a lot of journalists will use their phone, but only um, a camera uh, will use their phone if they have to. They want a professional camera. And a lot of mobile journalism content is edited on a desktop. And it also depends a lot on where it's going. So if it's going on television and radio, uh, the workflow will be different compared to if it's going on social. Uh, it will depend on whether it's being made on an iPhone or an Android phone. Um, and it'll also depend on what you define as mobile, right? So mobile also means everything that fits in a backpack. So defining it and studying it is quite difficult. Um, the thing is, though, that it doesn't really matter how you define it. The point is that the smartphone is good enough. And yesterday, Jane Barrett, who's uh, global head of multimedia at Reuters and has been involved in training 3,000 people uh, to take photographs, a lot of that is on a smartphone, said the iPhone photograph is good enough and good enough is good enough. That's also true of video. Um, I'm just going to show you a short mashup uh, film, which is combining footage from an RTE, Ireland package, shot and edited on a phone, and a conventional BBC3 package, which has been shot, and, uh, shot on a conventional camera and then edited on a desktop. So if you could play that for me, please. I'd recommend hitting the YouTube link at the bottom. That's very good for people who are living with dementia um, to sing along to the music. It brings back different memories from times gone by. 
I will spray the room with lemon cologne. I will put on my jukebox, which plays all the old music like Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra. They're coming into the barber shop and it's bringing back the memories. It's more than just a haircut or a shave. <laughs> There's so many men living with dementia that you know find it hard getting to the, the barber shop. So this service is much needed. Okay, so did you see that that was shot with two different sets of cameras? Okay, so th that's my clever editing, but it's also just gives you an idea of the quality control. It's not a problem. Okay, so with that out of the way, um, there's a couple of case study observations I want to share with you. First of all, smartphones are levelling the playing field because they make cameras accessible to everybody, to journalists, to civil society, to NGOs and to the audiences. And then also because everyone owns a phone, including the audience, it doesn't just level the field, it changes the game completely. Um, you can have television journalists making podcasts, you can have radio reporters taking photographs, you can also import uh, content from the audience. We, I don't think we've even begun to really tap into what they can do for our industry. So it's just hugely interesting and everyone in this room, I know you all put your hands up earlier, we're already doing this, um, understands that and I've, I find it interesting that there are not more people here. It's, you guys are at the edge of a huge wave. That's the first observation. And the second observation I'll make is that in Western countries, what I've observed as a trainer, Western countries, it's still individual innovation is what you see in mobile. It's not universal. And what I see in training in, in developing countries is that everybody wants to get on this and the benchmark for production and how people are thinking about this is very, very high in the developing world. So I feel we have some catching up to do. So I'm going to run through some very quick case studies. Uh, first of all, two from newspapers. Uh, the first example is the Hindustan Times. So a couple of years ago, Yusuf Omar and Sanjay Biswas trained 750 journalists, that's everybody, uh, to report with a smartphone. And now, two years later, they're getting content from across the country. It's filed both by journalists, they also source content from the audience, and it's all sent in through WhatsApp. So it's just very, very quick. And Sanjay says, this is allowing us to reflect the vastness of India back to itself. And the cost of doing that with conventional cameras, even with DSLRs, would have been prohibitive. So it's just completely changed the way that they do their journalism. And then we have individual in innovation. An example of that is at Trinity Mirror in London. So the Black Mirror podcast has been out since December. And what happened with that was it was the idea was to put out a six episode series timed with the release of the Black Mirror season four on Netflix. And they did a, an interview that they thought was going to be text with Charlie Brooker and recorded it on a smartphone with a smart, uh, smart lab um, clip mic and had a listen back and thought, actually, the audio's fine. We'll put that out as a bonus episode and we'll put some of that content into each of the subsequent episodes. And it rated really, really well with the audience. And it's been in binge-worthy since December and it went straight to number two in iTunes. And the total cost of making that podcast was 200 pounds. So it's just phenomenal. Okay, so to radio stations, I did say this was quick. Um, okay, so first to the developing world. So I've just been to Algeria and trained these guys. Um, radio Saida is a regional station of the national broadcaster Radio Algeria. Um, it's a developing country. Saida is a small town, 150,000 people. What they wanted was video to drive Facebook views and what they didn't have was a budget. So we used free apps, we used um, a range of Android phones, a couple of iPhones, and for a microphone people use their headsets, so that was it. Um, and what they got was video for free. Um, their followers, which had been sitting around 19,000 for three years, went up 4,000 the week after the training as they started to put up this video. And one of their videos went viral. The last time I looked, it had 300,000 views, which is not bad, because that's twice the population of the town. Again, it's impossible with conventional equipment. Now I want to go to um, ABC Radio National, which is the national public broadcaster in my country. Um, again, individual innovation, couple of programs there, Off Track, which is an environment program, and Life Matters, which is lifestyle, um, are starting to bring in content from the audience. And this is what made this make this slide deck, 
is that they're not only getting the audience to file bits of audio which they send in however they send it, usually over email, um, as inserts or comments, but they're using it to make entire programs. And that, to me, is unheard of. Um, there's links to all of this content in a Google Doc which you'll find on my Twitter account. Um, they've also put together some guidelines for the audience on, on how to shoot and edit, um, well, not shoot, not shoot and edit, but shoot and file their audio clips and their video clips in a way that's good enough for broadcast. And I've, that's also quite pioneering. Um, now we're to multi-platform broadcasters. And these are the big guns. Um, they're big Western newsrooms, they've got big budgets, and they really set the bar for what's possible, I think, um, in smartphone journalism. So the first one is CBC Canada, which Sue mentioned. They rolled out Mojo training across the business. Every journalist has access to an iPhone and is expected to use it for their job. Because they've been trained, there's solid buy-in at most of the um, station managers uh, to run that content which sometimes you see pushback on that. That's not happening at uh, CBC. And they have this new project which is called Rome, Reporter Out and Mobile. That's Dan McGarvey going around regional towns where they don't often see a CBC reporter um, to cover underreported issues. And the feedback from the audience has been, we're really happy to see you, we never see you. So it's affordable and accessible with a smartphone. And... Yeah, that's been great. They are always pleased to see CBC and their communities giving coverage to local issues. So it's been a big deal for the people in, in Alberta. And then lastly to um, RTE, this is my last media example. They've been innovating with Mojo for five years. It's, it's way past individual into standardised newsroom practice. Last year, they created a digital first team, which is a team of four journalists that shoot and edit on their phones, and they put it out on social first and then on television. And because it's social first, it's informed by what makes content shareable. And that's really interesting because all of that content is human interest, it reflects audience interests, they use tools like Crowd Tangle to listen back to what people want and that helps them define their story angles and approaches. And you'll see here, down the bottom there, the two most viewed and engaged with stories on Facebook across all RTE platforms last year were shot and edited on iPhone, that's one thing, by someone who had never produced a report for television. That's the other thing. It fast tracks video skills. And that's just massive and at, at low cost. Okay, um, RTE is helping to host a big conference on mobile journalism in Galway next month. So uh, that's the thing there at Mojo Festival. Um, it's not rocket science. Visit the um, Twitter account, you'll be able to see the website. My final slide is NGOs and civil society. I've got one case study, but it's replicated across the NGO world. These are not people who are worried about legacy broadcasting because that's not their background. Um, these are people who tell stories that would not otherwise get told. El Cool is a donor-funded project uh, run by BBC Media Action. It provides independent news for Libya out of the Tunis office. What they do is they train journalists and NGOs. The journalists, when they go home, report for El Cool and they get paid. And the NGOs go home and they cross-publish on their own Facebook pages and to El Cool where appropriate. And so you get this wonderful, reflective, audience-focused content that's purely the result of teaching people to use their phones professionally. So a couple of final thoughts from me. Where next? Um, mobile phones are good enough. I think it should be universal. I'm always astonished as to why it isn't. Um, and also smartphones are unique in their ubiquity. By the end of this year, there'll be 2.5 billion smartphones. There's huge potential for audience storytelling. I think we've got funders here who are interested in innovative projects. And if you can cook up something around this, I think you're away. You should be really thinking about it. And Mojo-friendly media outlets are pioneering that now. And I really think it's time for um, conventional newsrooms to step up. Those are the thanks there. Everyone's mentioned in my Google Doc. So you'll see down the bottom there, there's a pinned tweet. I'll leave it pinned until 8 o'clock tonight. So if you want access to that Google Doc, you can hop onto my Twitter. Thanks very much. These days, even deaf people can shoot and edit a video on their smartphone. These days, young Muslims can break down stereotypes and share their success. And even shy people can feel comfortable in front of a camera. 
It's 2018, and I want to talk to you today about how smartphone video can empower journalists as well as vulnerable communities. And I think this is really important because um, there's a lot of stories out there that aren't being told. Voices aren't being heard, and um, some people are, some stories are being overlooked. This is especially interesting, I think, when people are marginalized or simply overlooked like people with a disability, physical or mental disability, uh, Muslims, Christians, people of faith in general, kids and young adults in the Netherlands, especially with a uh, Moroccan background, and also just people who are uncomfortable in front of a camera. Well, I will introduce myself. My name is Geertje Algra. I've been a Mojo now for four years and a uh, Mojo trainer for three years. It's my mission to empower people to tell their story with their own phone. I've trained close to 2,000 people to tell their story, either with the an Android or iPhone device. My youngest student was a 10-year-old boy in Amsterdam, and my uh, oldest students were uh, close to retirement. I really love my job. Um, what slide are we on? Yep, yeah, this one. <laughs> This, yeah, I was here, okay. Um, I think it's especially important to train people whose stories never get told, whose stories are not being seen by journalists, are simply being overlooked. I've trained two groups of people who are hearing impaired or deaf, and um, I wanna show you a short clip. Hopefully it'll start up. The sound. It is really. Dus als jij een close-up wil maken, moet je er naartoe. It's been both interesting and very rewarding to train um, people who are deaf or hearing impaired. Uh, interesting because uh, every little thing I said was translated by uh, two sign language inter interpreters. But it's also been very rewarding because the people felt really empowered to tell their own story with their phone. Uh, I want to show you uh, two clips of, stu of my students. The first one from Jessica. I take you mee in my experiences and beleefingen op weg naar werk. Gaat het mij lukken om een baan te vinden? Je komt er vanzelf achter. And then the second one of Sophie. They both love to um, do this nowadays. And Jessica uses it to find a job. And Sophie just likes the speed and accessibility of mobile journalism. Well, now back to 2014, when I started my Mojo endeavor. I want to tell you a bit about how I got obsessed with this, because I'm really obsessed. I read somewhere online, TV quality with an iPhone, and I thought, you know, is this possible? It sounds really interesting, though. Uh, and as soon as I could, I uh, flew to Geneva to do a training at the EBU, uh, and Mark Egan, you see the arrow, was my trainer, and Mia was the only female in the group. And uh, it really, the one-day training changed my life. Shortly after, I wanted to practice my uh, new skills, on the streets of Utrecht, in my hometown, and the topic was Ramadan. In Mecca, Arabia. Loopt jou? Ja. Ik draai. Ik kan het niet. 
Wat nou mag wel? Wat mag. <laughs> ik kan dit echt niet! Wat mag je nou wel tijdens Ramadan en wat mag je nou niet tijdens Ramadan? Als je een menstruatie hebt, mag je dan vasten? Well, to my surprise, it was very easy to find people on the street that wanted to participate. Both white people and people of color volunteered to be on camera. And I've done similar reports on the street with a camera crew, and it was always very hard, especially to find women with a hijab to appear on camera. Not this time. They were really interested in me being an iPhone journalist, and they were very happy to participate. Um, um, it was easy to connect with them, and it also made them very relaxed that I told them, you know, if, if you don't like the interview, we can just look at it, and you know, you can see it, and can e I can even uh, delete it if you want. That really builds trust. Um, since that very first Mojo experience, I've continued to make um, reports about Dutch Muslims. Me, my iPhone, and Dutch Muslims, I, it just clicked. And I was very happy that I finally found a way to bring more diversity on Dutch television. Because there has been, and there's always been, and still is nowadays, a lack of diversity in Dutch media. This book was just published last week. Uh, it's it's uh, written by two diversity experts, and the title is somewhat translated, uh, Have You Got an Angry Muslim for Me? Well, the authors interviewed 62 um, Dutch journalists, most with a migrant background. And it's, um, yeah, it's pretty um, yeah, rough what they say. Uh, they say the lack of diversity in the newsroom and in the media is harming journalism. And I couldn't agree more. There's a lot of negative framing, especially from Dutch Moroccans. I have used Mojo to make positive stories, especially about third generation Moroccans. And since I have converted, uh, I've noticed converted to smartphone journalism, I've noticed a huge change in the amount of stories I could tell. And that's why I think that every journalist, well, most of you are already, should know at least the basic skills of Mojo. It will empower you to tell stories, more story, stories and other stories. Here's a report I shot at the Dutch Weekend School. It's a supplementary school for underprivileged kids. And Mojo made this report possible. Ik ben Sabri en ik ben 12 jaar en ik zit op de Weekend School van Amsterdam West. Oh, ik ben Safa, ik ben 11 jaar. Ik zit op basisschool De Roos en ik doe de IMC weekendschool. Ik heb mijn togen aangedaan. Hoe voelt dat? Uh, het voelt heel erg leuk en nu voel ik me een echte advocaat. Wij zijn de advocaten van Ronnie. Wat ik het leukst vond vandaag is om uh, advocaat te spelen en om Ronnie te verdedigen. Het leukste vond ik om een advocaat na te spelen. Ik vond het ook heel leuk om te praten. Dus ja, dat... Je houdt een beetje van praten. Ja. Well, Mojo really made this possible for me. Uh, as you can notice probably, the kids are very much at ease. I prefer a more kind of constructive uh, journalism to give a realistic view of what's happening in Dutch society. I don't want to report only on the problems. And uh, I think Mojo is really perfect um, for that. I've made a short list of the advantages. Uh, for me, the huge advantage is I can just go. I literally, I only take my phone, my small uh, tripod, and my microphone with me, and I, I can just go and see what happens. I don't have to book anything, a camera, a camera crew, nothing. Just go. I can be a fly on a wall, because um, it's just less noticeable when you're filming with a, with a smartphone. I can engage with my audience while and during, during I'm making a report. So before and during and after, it's very easy to um, put posts on social media and ask my followers, what do you think about this? I think that's also a huge advantage. And when I stumble onto uh, something that's really important, I can quickly edit it on my phone and send it back to the newsroom. Well, one last group I wanna talk to you about, and that are the shy people. 
I don't know how it is in your country, but in the Netherlands, we see the same people all over again on TV all the time. And I like to, re uh, to use my iPhone reports to uh, report on people who've never been on TV and uh, maybe are not so social, sa so media savvy. Uh, this is a clip I shot in Amsterdam uh, about Easter. Wat betekent Pasen voor jullie? Uh, ik weet dat niet. Paaseieren zoeken, want dat is heel erg gezellig. Pasen is voor mij ja, dat Jezus dood gaat. Pasen is voor mij uh, ja, de opstanding van Jezus. En dan vieren we ook wel weer dat hij ja, weer levend wordt. Volgens mij is het met paasfeest gaat over de, over de opstanding, dat Jezus weer levend wordt. Pasen is voor mij dat er elke keer een nieuw begin is. Dat vieren we met Pasen. Well, see, even shy people can feel comfortable in front of the camera and talk about their beliefs. I hope you feel inspired today by this session to tell your story or to help other people to tell their story. Uh, I want to stress that uh, you can do it on any phone. You know, it doesn't have to be the newest iPhone. It can also be a lower end phone. It's not about the pixel count. It's about the storytelling. And I want to end this presentation with a short clip uh, with smartphone advice from kids, because they are the next generation. Please enjoy. Thank you. Oh. Could you run this one? Oh. It's a nice one, the last one. <laughs> Um, I was really pleased to have the opportunity to talk about making journalism fair, uh, fairer using smartphones today because it's something I really believe in. Um, so I work at the uh, Centre for Community Journalism at Cardiff University um, where uh, I work with community journalists and have done since we set up the centre six years ago and we do a combination of research, outreach, development and training in this field. Um, and smartphones are something that are really important to people in our sector because it's a tool that you've got with you all the time. In a previous life, before I went to Cardiff University to set up the centre, I was a journalist at the BBC for nearly 14 years. And I experienced what I class was the first tranche of mojo. So Michael Rosenblum uh, came into the BBC and trained uh, lots of people to use to shoot and edit their own footage. And up until that point, we'd always had to rely on cameramen and sound men. We had to book a crew. So I couldn't just go anywhere and film. I had to, um, get my interviewees ready, and then I had to check when they were available, when I was available, when there was a cameraman, when there was a, a sound man available, um, which was quite prohibitive. Um, and actually, for me, it was the first time, because I could pick up my own camera, it was a Sony sort of video camera, it was still a proper video camera, but it was something, it gave me the freedom that I could actually be mobile and I could go and film my own stories. So this is an extension, mobile, uh, mobile journalism is an extension of that. And people say, is it mobile if it's not on a mobile phone? And I just say, if it fits in my handbag, it's mobile. So I can take it with me. Um, so I took these photographs, I go every year, I'm a bit of a geek, uh, so this is the Broadcast and Video Expo in London, so I took these photographs uh, last year, I go every year, and every single year I get asked the price of something on one of the stands because they think that I work there because there's not women that ever go there. And this is a hangover from the days when, um, we, I say cameramen and sound men because kits were expensive. I, the first cameraman I worked with at the time, his camera, his big video camera cost more than his house. So his house cost him £50,000 and his camera cost him £60,000. It was big, it was expensive, and it was heavy. So it's always been the domain of men historically for those reasons. Um, so I'm glad to say that we are completely smashing that out of the window. Uh, completely, there's a lot more women that go to these things now and do uh, filming as well. So uh, it's changed. The, the raise in accessibility with smartphones is changing all of this. Um, so with the growth of mobile journalism and community journalism, I've seen a real seismic shift in attitudes towards women filming, towards other people filming. It's not seen as, as prestige anymore. Um, so they go hand in hand because um, mobile journalism is low cost, it's accessible, um, there's no barriers to entry whatsoever, 
and it's not gender specific. So I'm not saying too heavy for me to carry, thank you very much. So anybody can use them. So hands up if you've all got a smartphone. Yeah, it's probably easy to ask anybody in the room that doesn't have a smartphone. No, nope, so we're all with it. So we've already got the tools. Um, so what we have found, so in working with journalism, what I found is that sometimes some people say, well, I'm, there's no point in us speaking to journalists because our voices don't get heard. So um, this is a photograph of an estate in a town called Merthyr Tydfil in Wales, and it's called the Gurnos Estate. So over 5,000 people live um, in the Gurnos, and unemployment is really high there. Uh, more than 28% of children there live in poverty. And residents told us there's no point in us engaging with journalists at all because they, they, our voices aren't important, they put words in our mouths, our stories aren't told. So we did a, a social experiment and we set up a, a mobile-only newsroom, a, a journalism after-school club in two primary schools in the Gurnos. Um, so for 10 weeks, once a week, um, for 10 weeks I'd go to each of the schools and with primary school children and their parents we went through what is journalism, what stories are important to you, um, and, uh, and help them set up their own newsrooms. Because if they didn't have the trust in journalists and nobody went there to kind of tell the kind of stories they wanted to tell, they wanted to talk about crime, unemployment. That's what people going into the area wanted to talk about, whereas the people living there wanted to talk about different things. So we uh, went in, and the uh, After School Journalism Club, we set up a website called North Merthyr Voice, and it gave them the voice and the opportunity to tell their own stories. So we asked these children, they were aged between seven and nine years old, and their parents, what kind of things did they want to talk about? And they said issues that were important to them were um, littering in the area, they wanted to clean up the litter, there was too much dog mess, there was graffiti, lack of bins. So they wanted to tackle these issues to make their, their community a better place to live. So we uh, went about teaching them the basics of journalism, the who, what, when, where, why. So what we've done is we've now taken away the need to learn how to use a really big camera and we can concentrate on the journalism and the story. Um, so this is uh, a footage um, from one of the, uh, the first interviews. So we've got uh, somebody in from Keep Wales Tidy and they worked on their questions and this was all filmed with the, and edited with the children on a smartphone. Common areas for fly tipping, what are you doing to tackle the problem? We recently tackled some fly tipping quite close to the school here and that's quite tricky because legally it's the farmer's responsibility to, to take the, the fly tipping away although it obviously wasn't him that put the fly tipping there so it's a, it's a little bit tricky and yeah. um, that's where Keep Wells Tidy comes in to try and be a bit helpful really um, and work with loads of different people, working with some volunteers as well um, and hopefully deal with the situation that way. Um, lack of bins, what are you doing to tackle the problem? Are you getting the impression there's becoming less litter bins? When bins reach the end of their lifetime, when they become all rusty and a little bit sorry looking, um, the council take them away and don't replace them. So that was all filmed on one phone and edited on one phone, but it looks as if there, were, there was more than one camera there. So what we did, and if you can teach this to six-year-olds, you can teach it to anyone, that it's about framing a shot probably. That was a bit wobbly, the, the seven-year-old was a little bit... Well, she was filming it, but she was seven. Um, so the, the thing that we taught was if you shoot all the answers first, then you shoot the questions and get some cutaways, you'll always be able to cut to length. You can always make it as long as you want to, make it as short as you want. You can put it for social. They all wanted to be YouTubers, so we could say you can put it on YouTube. They were delighted. Um, but actually, it meant that they had something of quality. Um, and it's, it's teaching those skills are really, really important. And that's mo far more important in my eyes than what you're actually filming on. Um, it's also important to realise that not everybody is comfortable and confident in being in front of a camera. And lots of people have got stories to tell. So there's lots of ways video can be made in many different ways using smartphones. Um, so this is one little boy who uh, sat on the school anti-bullying committee. So he did this uh, of an evening, had never used the app. It was done with Adobe Spark. Uh, he and his mum went home, had a play with it, had never used it before, and this is what they came up with. What is bullying? Bullying is when someone says or does something intentionally hurtful and they keep on doing it more than once, even when you tell them to stop or show them that you're upset. 
And that's bullying. What can we do to stop bullying? We need to start telling other people and let them help. At Wayvaran Primary School, we don't tolerate bullying. We have an anti-bullying committee where we are friends against bullying. And that again, it's video, and it's video made with a smartphone. So there's not your traditional, I'm going to hold my camera up, I'm going to interview you. But actually, it's a way of getting stories uh, across from children who were saying, we live in a community, their parents, their grandparents were saying, there's no point engaging with journalism because our voices don't get heard anyway. So there's lots of different ways of creating video and content and professional looking content using smartphones. So the other mobile-only digital newsroom that we've set up as an experiment, I don't expect any of you to say this word, it's Eisteddfod. So it's a, it's a Welsh language festival and it uh, travels to a different location uh, across the country once a year, every year, it goes to a different location. So we wanted to see if we could set up a um, mobile digital-only newsroom um, in a field in Wales uh, with very much not much signal and not many facilities at all to generate if we could do a newsroom uh, on that basis. So we set, uh, we uh, got students and we trained them up so they'd have a week's training in journalism and stories. Um, and then uh, this one particular year, we also trained uh, young people um, called NEET, so not uh, currently in education or employment. So they didn't have any prospects um, of um, getting into journalism. So we taught them how to use their um, smartphones. So this video um, is to the First Minister of Wales. Every single year, um, the pre his press officers try and stop us from getting an interview, and every year I rugby tackle him and say, go, go, go. And because we've got a smartphone, it's really easy. You just kind of hit go and record, and we've got it. We haven't got to worry about getting your 10 seconds of roll and tape and everything to go to start with. So this, uh, Geraint, is a, a young person who was not in education or employment. We'd been teaching him um, journalism skills for a week and how to shoot and edit on a smartphone along with his, some of his friends. Um, and this was him asking a question to the First Minister of Wales. So since uh, Brexit has happened, do you feel that as a country we'll be able to sustain and improve the education system? Yeah, I think we can improve the education system. I think there are issues about research funding for universities that haven't been resolved yet because they are reliant on uh, a lot of European funding. That would have to be made up by the UK government. But no, we, we can develop our education system as we want it in Wales and, and fund it uh, you know, even in difficult times so that it continues to improve. Uh, that again was a bit wobbly. There's a theme here, isn't there? Uh, but again, we were wrestling with the First Minister's press officers who were trying to get him away from us. But um, the key there is that it was very, very, very windy. It was dark, it was raining. Um, but actually, the sound quality was excellent. And people will forgive bad uh, pictures, but they will not forgive bad audio. So um, it's teaching the skills that um, if... So there, we happen to have a flash mic with us. So somebody was filming, but actually in a windy environment, that probably would have been unusable. So as you can see, we use a flash mic. But otherwise, you can just use another phone. Chances are everybody in the room's got one. So if somebody wants to film on one, use the other one like a microphone. So this is 99 pence. And you can just put that over the end, which makes it look really professional, apart from the fact it's pink. Uh, so then that looks like you've now got your own flash mic. And then you can sync the audio up afterwards. Or I've seen somebody before now take a sock off their foot and actually put a sock over it. Anything to stop the wind in the microphone. But actually it's teaching those kinds of things that actually that would have been unusable if we'd have just kind of picked up and run with it. So it's only little things like that make a really big difference. Again, it's about giving people the skills to use uh, mobiles properly. And this one was cut more like a proper package. So we're on a bridge. What's going on? Well, behind this is uh, well, loads of pads on the floor. Yeah. And it measures how much energy you put in when you stand on it and you've got a meter up there that, that shows you if, you if loads of people are jumping on it it goes <laughs> so do you think this is more of a scientific thing or with uh, smart energy and gb they need to well, show everyone how easy it is to measure uh, electric and to persuade people to get uh, meters at home yeah and then they can see and save money on how much electric or gas they're using so it's a simple way just to get people to know well do you think this is the way of the future or Oh, definitely. It's, uh, it's been a laugh. I've been uh, jumping and over the handkerchief here, and uh, <laughs> hopefully you're going to have a go now. So again, that was a really noisy environment, everyone jumping up and down. So it's little things like making sure that your audio is right. So in that instance, we just had a Rode microphone that just clipped straight into the headphone jack. 
Um, I've got one in my bag, which is just a, a £10, a double level ear. But again, if all else fails, just use another smartphone for audio. If all else fails, you can do a podcast or do an audio clip out of it with a still over it. There's all kinds of things that you can do. But the main lesson I kind of want to take away is that it is accessible, but it's about teaching people the right skills. Otherwise, it's like having a Ferrari and not having a driving license. Having all the gear and no idea is absolutely no good at all. So people are kind of quite keen to go out and buy really expensive camera equipment and feel that kind of makes them more professional but if you don't know the basics who what when where why how to shoot in a sequence and how to frame a shot then actually that really doesn't matter at all so um so basically you know i do believe that it does make journal uh, mobile journalism is far more accessible due to smartphones but actually we still need to learn the skills to do it properly and thank you very much for listening thank you we have about 20 minutes for questions, I think. Uh, we're due to knock off at 4.30, so if anyone has any questions to the panel, just um, pipe up. And I will show my uh, clip maybe at the end of my presentation Panu. later. <laughs> Panu, please. Yeah. Yes. Hello, thank you. It was really interesting. Thank you. So uh, I have this kind of question. We have uh, good experiences of mobile journalism in our newsroom. but. Uh, I have noticed that it's uh, very difficult sometimes to adapt mobile journalism uh, properly in newsrooms and in, in those daily routines. Uh, usually people uh, are really, really enthusiastic when, when they are uh, training uh, mobile journalism, mm -hmm. but uh, after the training they don't use those skills and forget what they have learned. So do you have any tricks for that? What should we do? What uh, I, I can see your point. What uh, I've seen is that people are trained, and then um, the management or you know their their uh, how do you say chef or or somebody, uh, the person in charge, doesn't really want them to put any time and effort in it. So I think that's a, that's a big thing. Is if as a company or a news uh, station you want people to do this, you want these other stories to be told, then you also have to uh, give your people a little bit of time uh, to do this. And, you know, uh, I know as journalists we have to do already so many things, you know, we have to do this and we have to do, do social and then we have to do this. And then we also have to do all these videos on our phone, of course, if it's extra work. Uh, I was in the session this morning, we will all be burned out, you know, so it has to be... Um, Somebody has to say, you know, this is what we're going to do, and you have time to, to learn it. I think just to add to that, the, the newsrooms that I've been training, again, in developing countries, there is wholesale buy-in to the idea that this is the camera they're going to use. And so there's no question that straight after the training, what's been learned will be implemented. And I think, you know, like, like any skill in a newsroom, I think it's when you learn a new software editing package or you learn, you know, how to use a new device or you're, you've got a new studio, everyone's shown how to use it and then you immediately start using those skills. And so I think, like any good learning program, if you build the learning outcomes, uh, the, if the learning outcomes include this is going to be used in practice, then you get much better results. And that, for sure. Two things and almost counterintuitive. Uh, sometimes some reporters, uh, at, certainly at the student level, um, are more comfortable starting out with social and doing something more concise than, say, a traditional video news package. Um, they get an opportunity then, as you saw in the uh, bullying video, you can use uh, it's, apps are not just for kids. Uh, you can use some of the social media apps like the Adobe Spark Suite. There's video, there's post, you can build graphics, there's all kinds of stuff. There's also Quick, people familiar with Quick by uh, the fine folks at um, GoPro. Uh, there's any number of, of commercial apps that lend themselves really well to Mojo journalism and it, it gives people a bit of energy to see what they can do. On the other end of it, I have found that some uh, more experienced reporters and photographers are more interested when they see some of the really sophisticated apps that are out there because they're used to working on uh, more professional cameras. So when you show them uh, shooting apps such as a Filmic Pro 
or editing apps like LumaFusion. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people are familiar with these or not, but when they see the amount of control and flexibility that they can pull out of a camera with things that cost, you know, less than a nice, well, if you bought both of those, it'd probably set you back about uh, 40 euros. Am I about right there? I'm trying to convert to Canadian to American to euros. But, um, you know, you, if you're prepared to spend a bit of money, you can get a remarkable amount of flexibility and control and quality out of your camera, even above and beyond what the, na the native camera will do. And those things, keep it really simple and fun and make it more complicated. <laughs> you know, they both seem to work for some people, depending yep. on who you're talking to and who you're working with. Uh, and my experience when I was um, in the BBC was at a time where the BBC adopted the iPhone as a smartphone of choice, so all work phones are going to be iPhones and everybody was supposed to work and film. And we found that some people were saying, I'm just too busy, I've been on the course and now I'm doing my day job. And what we found was that some people were really keen and were getting a lot of success. And then when that news organisation, that newsroom were making a big fuss of the success, then other people are going, oh, actually, I'm being left behind here. So actually to really encourage and support the ones that you might only have, you might send 10 people on a training course and two yeah. of them really take to it, encourage and nurture those two, and then the others will start to see, oh, actually, I'm falling behind. So that really helps as well. Leave the dinosaurs and they'll catch up and they feel like they're missing out. In the trainings that we were running within um, third world country communities, um, basically it goes all well, everybody's happy, and then we come to a problem of storytelling. It's not so much the technology, it's not the distribution, it's how you actually get to the good stories. Mm -hmm. Do you have any tips to share or trainings to recommend that we can actually follow up with these people to? Do you, oh, sorry, do you want to introduce yourself? I'm <laughs> Sophia, working for Yala Iraq. Okay, yeah. Um, gosh, I'm, I mean, I, I think the, the, there are a number of organisations that are offering training. So Thompson Foundation has been rolling out online training, um, which is very good. Um, there are a couple of trainers up here, so, you know, you can talk to us. <laughs> um, but I, I, th I think, you know, in developing country environments... Um, I'm hesitant to draw a qualitative difference. You know, journalists are journalists. That's been my experience. Going anywhere in the world, we are a single tribe, yeah? Um, it's more what kind of equipment do you have access to and, and what does that then mean for uh, the, the challenges that you're going to have to navigate along the way? So my journalists, uh, my journalist trainees in uh, Saida don't have a budget for clip microphones and also it's not actually possible for NGOs in Libya to buy them because they don't have a system for online shopping. So, <laughs> so they can't even buy them even if they can afford them. Um, you know, so they, th the way that I manage that in the training is that we just use the headsets. Um, there's a, we, we can talk later if you like about resources that are available um, for training. But when it comes to story, you know, the secret code um, from back when I worked at the CBC was what we called focus. Someone doing something for a reason. And when you're working with video, if you can see two out of those three elements, you're set. Um, if all you have is a bunch of pretty pictures, then put it on social. But if, if you have a focus story that people can care about, that is that is half the battle, I think, one. I don't mean to oversimplify it, but in a context like this, um, looking up someone doing something for a reason is always a start. And a fairly traditional structure to all of these things doesn't start with background, but starts with a hook that's going to get people into the, into, the, into the tent, as they used to say in the carnivals, right? A little bit of background, and then let the story unfold. And we know from watching movies that our most important elements are the first and last bits. Right, so you want to have, you want to think ahead and have that strong. You know, smartphones don't let you off the hook for planning or putting thought into your stories, um, but when you do that, you have a lot less coordination and chasing other people around to help you time done with. And if you play with it a bit, you'll see how much you can do with it. I just, yep. um, the the panel has very kindly given me permission to just make one more comment, which is to speak about your your question about storytelling. So there's two things that I'll say about this. The first is that. Poor storytelling is unwatchable irrespective of who tells it, 
right? Could also be journalists. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's true. And I, and I think, you know, when you're working with, say, uh, you know, people who are used to audio storytelling or print storytelling, all of the learning that goes with traditional video journalism has to go into that training, you know? So uh, when, you're, when you're teaching a television journalist how to make a podcast with a phone and anybody how to take a photo with a phone, you need to address those core skills as well as how to use the device to um, have those skills. And I think part of the temptation, because we all own a phone, is to treat it like a toy. So one of the things that I emphasise in my training is you no this is no longer uh, you know, something that you play Angry Birds on. <laughs> this is a professional storytelling device and I want you to think about it and treat it in those terms. I always tell people it's not a phone. Please don't call me. Yeah. <laughs> there are some other questions. Hi, yeah, um, I think this probably follows on from Corinne's point um, that she just made, actually. But um, uh, my name's Lawrence. I've worked on a variety of mobile um, uh, community-based storytelling projects in Sierra Leone, Nigeria, and in the UK. And um, I have a, a specific question about the emphasis that you place within the trainings, particularly when you're working with marginalized groups, often with low confidence, low mm. capacity. Um, how much emphasis do you place on the safety and security of this new reporter or new community storyteller? Because I think there's, particularly when you're using a device that you're very familiar with, there is a tendency sometimes to lose the lines between the professional and the personal. And I just, yeah, any reflections you could give on that over time would be, uh, yeah, really great. Um, safety is... is the most important thing and actually they're quite expensive so you know when you when you walk in around somewhere particularly if it's if it's um, you know uh, not particularly a nice area then you have to have your safety in mind it's the same as when you first learn self shooting it's it's everything from it's not just being mugged for your actual device but it's watching where you step it's where you're walking so making sure whether you've got somebody with you at all times um, and actually making sure that you um, Treat it, treat it with respect, and that you're still there doing a proper job. So, in what kind of instance do, are you con concerned about safety? Um, I mean, I, I think that it's just. Sorry. Oh, sorry. You know, I guess it's kind of about the rigors of the training to a point, because I mean, a a journalist working for the BBC, for example, would often go through maybe hostile environment training or really recognizing the times to yield their position as a storyteller to the dangers of the situation. And I think, yeah, and I'm speaking from experience with the similar type of projects that, you know, that's always been one of my slight concerns is. Mm -hmm. It's something, I'll just, uh, yeah. with the BBC Media Action Training in Libya, uh, in Tunis that is for Libya, um, that is absolutely addressed. And it, it has to be addressed in greater detail perhaps than it would be for journalists because you're training NGOs who have wonderful story ideas about covering all kinds of things that um, are potentially very risky for them. Uh, and they don't have a media organisation behind them to protect them, to uh, you know, bail them out of prison, to stand behind their story. So absolutely, it, it has to be built into training. Again, you're, you're, you're teaching journalism that happens to be done on a smartphone, really. I, I was going to say the other element of safety as well is kind of physically, if you're kind of lone shooting, the other thing is actually knowing, keeping yourself safe in the eyes of the law. So in the UK, it's about knowing the rules about filming in a public place and, and COVID and overt filming. And it's something I feel really passionate about because when you're holding this up, then do people actually think you're going to be filming it and putting it on BBC One on the... B they don't. Um, so actually, is that if you're holding your phone like this on a little tripod and then I go in my handbag and do something else and I'm just getting an, an everyman shot, is that class as covert filming or is it overt filming? So there's keeping yourself safe in that instance as well as about knowing what the rules and regulations are um, surrounding that kind of um, filming in whatever country you're in as well. Okay. Thanks. We're good. More questions? Oh. Hi, I'm Jo Fay from the International Service of the Swiss Broadcasting Corporation. Um, we started last year training lots of our journalists to go out and film with mobile phones. And then I have to do a kind of quite a lot of um, follow-up training with people, helping them how to use them and so on. And um, my question for you is really, do you ever come to a point where you feel like you're asking too much from people? 
people who have worked as text journalists or radio journalists, they really struggle to sort of problem solve in the field or monitor their audio. Because sometimes I feel in the work that I'm doing with people, sometimes I come to the point where I think maybe they should just go out with a trained video journalist. Am I asking too much of people to try and get journalists to go out with a phone and film themselves? I would note that we're not running newsrooms. Um, but in terms of talking with people who run and work in newsrooms, um, that's going to vary. And as if, if you were here for any of the previous panel, they talked about the importance of managers watching out for their people. Um, having a smartphone is not going to put a new, turn a newsroom reporter into a machine. But it does, as, uh, as some reporters will say, gives them much more flexibility and saves them time. Um, I think about, say, Nick Garnett with the BBC, who prides himself on never going into the office um, because he can do so much, but he cannot do everything. Um, some newsrooms talk about if, if they have like a three or four different outlet uh, operation that on a given day you'll file for two or maybe three, and depending on the complexity of the story, work with a second reporter or journalist back in the newsroom. So it's really on newsrooms, I think, in, in traditional newsrooms, to think about how they can broker this without expecting it to be everything to everybody all the time. Does it make sense? To me, it's made my life much easier. You know, I, if I, I, before I was a camera journalist for KRO and CRV, uh, Dutch public television, and uh, when I made the shift from camera journalism to Mojo, I, I really felt so much better not carrying heavy stuff around, not having all the issues with, you know, hiring the camera and the disc and then the disc and then the disc in the computer and the laptop and the, you know, all these changes. I can now do one device only and it's made my life tremendously easier. But I guess it's not for everybody, you know? I would just, I'll just add, I think, uh, when you add a new skill and a new job requirement to people's uh, duties, you have to take something else away yeah. at a certain point. Exactly. Yeah? Um, I mean, in my life, I trained in newspapers, I moved into radio, then I worked in television, then I moved into online and social. Um, this is just another way of, of actually doing all of those jobs. Um, so it's a very liberating device. Yeah. I would recommend that you, you start with something simple that gives people simple wins, you know, so that they can look at their work and think, actually, that, I did that well, I'm happy with it. Um, I feel that it's on par with other ways that I would have done that story, right, other methods of doing the story, um, and build the enthusiasm that way. I think from my experience, what really helps is keeping it really simple to start with. So the fact that if they would normally go out and do a piece to camera, if they set the camera up, you're not expecting them to do it in Filmic Pro and monitor the audio levels and everything. Mm. As long as they know that it's not peaking and there's not bad wind noise, that's kind of good, that they don't have to overthink too many things. And then as they progress, then they kind of up their skill level. Uh, but if you keep it basic to start with, but it's down to the individual. Some people will take to it like a duck to water, and others will just hate it. Okay. We, we've been given Here. the time, time zone, so... Oh, okay. We have one more? Very, very quick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank Sorry. you. Uh, Thank you. Um, in which cases do you believe journalists should keep filming with a traditional camera? Like um, in low light or with um, a nice speed situation? What can justify uh, keeping the old traditional camera? You don't want to shoot a football game with this, right? The zoom is very limited. It's bad in low light. Um, any other quick, I wouldn't do that. A friend has said that, you know, you, the thing we always want to remember is that right now, this phone is as bad as it's ever going to be. These cameras are only getting better. The resources we have to work with them are only getting better. So if you get used to working with them, then you can up your game as the phones themselves improve. Okay. I, I wouldn't do the. No. I wouldn't think about the technical limitations because, of course, there are. But uh, for me, it's more the kind of story you want to tell. Mm. So sometimes the story is just in a way that I think like, hmm, I, I would like to go with two people or. Yeah. yeah, so if you, cover, if you have to go to a football game with a phone, maybe you cover it from the stands and less from yeah. the, mm -hmm. the action shots that you're not going to get. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for coming. And, thank you. Um, hope you see, here, see more from you. Thank you.